So today, welcome everybody. Uh, it's nice to see people signing on. Uh, we have about 52 folks so far. Uh, this is the next one of our Lunch in the Garden uh, free webinars here on Zoom uh, from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County. And we've been doing these since the beginning of the pandemic. Now it's like, hallelujah, this pandemic is winding down really. So we will be doing a few more of these webinars. Uh, we have several scheduled for March and into April. And um, yeah, Laura recognizes the background I have on today. So uh, <laughs> we're very glad you're here. And uh, we will be having another one next week. Uh, we have vegetable gardening containers coming up. So that's gonna be a lot of fun as well. So if you have any questions for today, you can type them in the chat box. We'll be reading through the chat box at the end and we'll get Denise to answer all the questions. Uh, these recordings are archived for your viewing pleasure on our Rensselaer County website, uh, Rensselaer County channel, I should call it. If you go to YouTube, which everybody watches all the time now to see the puppy and kitty videos, right? Go to YouTube, <laughs> type in Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County. You'll get to our channel and we're putting all of our recordings on there. We're a little behind, but we will be catching up with our Lunch in the Garden recordings. So uh, again, use the chat box. Uh, what else do we need to say? Uh, welcome, Denise. Denise Maurer is our speaker today, and she's going to be talking about houseplants. And that is something that we should all be, you know, thinking about this time of the year. That's one of our ways we can do horticulture in the winter. So thank you to Denise for being here. Denise talks on lots of different gardening topics. She's an interior designer and uh, has a good eye for all sorts of things, horticultural as well as colorful and design. So a lady with lots of talents. So welcome, Denise. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, David. And good morning, everybody. I'm just going to start by sharing my screen so that we can get right into the PowerPoint that I have for you. Okay, all of you see that okay? That looks good. Looks good, okay. The only thing I lose when I'm on PowerPoint is sharing my screen as my cursor. So um, anyway, I've got a few things that might block what I need to be looking at, but good morning, everybody, and welcome to Houseplants You Can Live With. And um, I have to say, I'm just so grateful that we are able to garden inside, um, especially since we have gardening seasons that are not um, months and months and months long. Um, those of us that are um, love nature and, and just love being around greenery and whatnot, it allows us to continue continue um, doing what we love. And um, it, it, for me, it gives me sanity. So what we're going to be talking about today is how to care for these. Um, some people might be beginners, some people might be well advanced in their journey of, of living with houseplants. But nonetheless, I think we've got enough tips for everybody. So I do hope that you um, have a pen and paper handy so you can take notes if you need to and um, feel free to enter any questions that I don't cover into the chat box and um, let's, let's take off. Okay, let's start with where do indoor plants come from? Um, because if you know where your plants come from, you're going to understand how to take care of them. <clears throat> and um, I'm gonna just move, uh, bring a couple of plants forward that I set out for you. And um, I'm not gonna ask a question. I'm basically gonna point out to you, um, excuse me, but I'm sure you like looking at plants more than me. Um, <laughs> I have two plants here. I have an orchid, a Phalaenopsis orchid, and I have this uh, wonderful lady with a Rahani um, cactus plant, which is in the succulent family. So, given those, um, they accurately get it. Um, they actually accurately show um, the difference in plant care, in um, especially inside. This cactus on the left side grows in a desert-like condition. It, um, ha it receives a lot of sun, it receives a lot of dryness and arid conditions, it does not receive a lot of moisture. Um, so in caring for this plant, um, as long as you give it 
sun um, and very little water, it is going to be a happy camper in your home. And um, I'm not going to turn my camera away, but I, I am in my office, which has a very bright window. And what I have grouped on that window is all of my succulents. Keeping them together kind of keeps me in the rhythm of watering and, and I don't overwater them with my other houseplants like this tropical that grows in the rainforest and, and um, uh, tropical locations, usually in the um, understory of trees. Um, it gets more shade, requires shade, so therefore it doesn't require as bright a light as this cactus does. And, um, and at the same time, because in the rainforest it rains a lot, it needs, it needs a little more moisture than this cactus. A cactus stores water in its um, plant parts, whereas an orchid receives their moisture mostly from the root system. The rain comes down, waters the, um, refreshes the plant roots and hydrates it, and then um, it's surrounded with humidity until the next frame. So this one requires moisture and less sun, and this one requires more sun and less water. So again, think about where those plants come from, and um, you will simplify your, your watering schedule. And, um, and that is the, the one main thing that you need to keep in mind. <clears throat> But besides other um, pleasures of houseplants, what, what do they do for us? I mean, we do for them. We, we think of them as something that we love to nurture and whatnot. But they do bring that outdoors indoors. And um, we've had more months inside than many of us have had and maybe even ever want to have indoors um, for a long time. But again, the, the, the ability to have those plants around us and give us a touch of nature, um, which has always been, has been proven that um, those qualities are um, make an impression on us as, as humans. Plus, they have aesthetic qualities. And of course, me as a designer, I love pretty things around me and pretty pictures and whatnot. So um, I find that I love to incorporate them into home settings um, as part of the interior design thing, because I do like to use a natural approach to things. It enhances our sense of well-being. There's nothing about being in nature to give us a sense of, of, of goodness and calmness. And so those of us that have enjoyed more than our share of anxieties through this pandemic, um, you may find that um, being surrounded by, by plants and whatnot will offer you a, a way to focus in on others and the qualities they have and take our minds off of the other things that are of concern. And I gotta say, it's been a satisfying hobby for me. I actually began houseplants when I was about 15, I think. And um, by the time I was 21, I was a young entrepreneur, in, entrepreneur doing plant parties, like the uh, familiar Tupperware parties that used to be done. I did plant parties. And um, so over the years, I've learned a lot about, about the um, care and maintenance of, of houseplants, but they just bring me so much joy that I can't imagine not having them around. And here's the big thing. They're great for cleaning your air. Um, that was discovered uh, by NASA back in 1980. I'll talk more about that, but it really does have a benefit to us. Um, you know, when I was prepping for this program, I'm like, why did I put this picture here in this location. I couldn't figure it out. And then I reviewed a past program and I figured it out. So what I'm hoping today is to turn a few novices into happy gardeners. So on the left, you see an air plant that is one of the ones designated for cleaning air and um, taking out odors. It is the peace lily, Staphylium. And um, over on the right, you will notice a little flower bud coming out to play. And that, I have to say, picture made my day um, because it was sent to me as a text from my granddaughter. She had moved into a new apartment and I had gifted her with this peace lily plant for her apartment. And what she was showing is she got her first bloom. So I have to say her house is now filled with houseplants and she is a very joyful um, 
a participant in the hobby of gardening. And she was hooked when she saw that she could nurture that, that bloom to fruition. Here are some of the um, plants that do actually purify your houseplants. There's many more, but we'll start with um, number one and two. They're both palms, the Eureka palm and the parlor palm. Um, your Sansevieria in the center, um, that one is one you can put in any location. It virtually can live without sunlight and almost hardly without water if you wanted to. Um, but then your spider plant and your peace lily again and some of your flowering plants. All of those plants um, take in and cleanse the air and bring it back to you. And how do we know that? We know that from the study in 1989 that NASA did. They actually loaded up their spacecraft with houseplants at, with the intention of of research into whether they eliminate toxins and whatnot. And what they found is, yes, it did eliminate toxins. Um, the toxins, the bad ones, like formaldehyde and benzene, tricker, I'm not sure I'm gonna say that right, trichloroethylene and tulian. Um, and they also find that it removes odors, which I'm sure they appreciated with, you know, several of them crowded into that small little spaceship. Um, on the right is the report that is easily pulled up from um, the internet if you wanted to go searching for it. Um, just go into NASA houseplant study or put that into your search engine and you'll be able to call it up. But um, that is proof that it does have an advantage to our, um, to our homes. Other plants um, are listed here, your Boston ferns, your aloe veras, um, ficus, ivies, philodendrons. Um, if you do want to enjoy the benefit of cleansing your air and removing odor, um, think about one plant per 100 square feet, which is equal to a 10 by 10 room. Um, and keep in mind, though, that doesn't do much for tobacco smoke. In fact, I have a story about that, too. Um, I had um, my, my other granddaughter um, came to my door with a palm, an areca palm. That was her grandmother's who had recently passed away from lung cancer. And uh, she had brought it to me because it had been um, in decline for a while because her, her grandmother was so sick. And she really wanted to keep this plant as a memory of her grandmother. And uh, so she asked me to care for it and, until she got herself back together and also um, to make sure that it's healthy and, and whatnot. So the one of the things I did when I received this plant in hand is that it smelled like anything um, of cigarette smoke. I mean, it was if somebody just lit up 10 cigarettes in, in the room and um, I'd never experienced anything like that. So the first thing I did is I started leaching the soil. I set it in the sink and um, ran water through it so that it sat in the water and could lift all the minerals and um, deposits that are in the soil and it started lifting the odors. Um, at first, when I set it in the water, I could not believe how brown the water was. I mean, I think about lungs and whatnot and the dear woman who had lung cancer, but it, this, this plant was trying its best to cleanse the air. And eventually with many, many, um, uh, soaks and leaching. Eventually, we uh, the plant re was restored and um, the odor was removed. And I'm happy to say six years later, Robin is thrilled with her Eureka palm and how well it's doing in her apartment. So odors be gone. Um, here you can see an example of a of nicely decorated, very cozy looking room. And um, those those plants that you see there not only add a sense of coziness, but they're there doing the work. And isn't that better than any electric air filter that you could put in place? I mean, just greenery and nature and um, all that it has to offer is just beautiful. So again, on the point that plants can be decorative and healthy for us as well, here you can see two more interior design options. A uh, palm on the left, which is a decorative floor plant, actually is not even in a source of light like a window. 
but it is getting additional light through the um, the light that is to the right on the tripod, that decorative element. And um, by giving it more uh, light by day, because it's not near a source of light, it will keep it um, healthy. Now it may not grow rambunctiously, but it will survive. Um, and this one is a very slow growing plant anyway. So uh, not a problem to put it in a dark corner, but most of your plants will need um, a source of light from windows. And um, over here on the right, you see this banana plant um, that is in, in the correct source of light. And look at how striking that is. If you can just sort of think about that room and take that pot right out of there, that room would be rather cold with the gray walls and, the, and no texture and, and no color. Um, but that plant just really strikes me as, wow, this is really neat. And it's working too. More um, on the left here, you can see an example of where they use green intentionally in their interior design by adding the, um, the green pots and um, using a black and white color scheme. If you took that green out of that room, um, I think we would look at that room and say, oh, that's a little bit too matchy-matchy for me. Um, but that green, just that touch of green breaks the eye and makes a very welcoming and, and happy impression looking at it. Now on the right, I'm actually showing you, I am gonna to get to the care, but <laughs> I'm showing you some interior design things. On the right, you'll see a new bath. Um, this is one of my recently completed projects and it shows how form and function work there. This is a master bath. Um, they reside out in the country in Greene County and um, so we removed a window in that area and created this bathing area, if you will, with an open shower and bathtub and added a garden window. And that those plants in that window actually serve as screening for privacy. So if somebody were to drive up in, in their driveway or something while they're showering, they have um, greenery there to protect them from, from being viewed. But at the same time, those plants are are benefiting too because they have all that wonderful um, humidity and sunlight um, and uh, whatnot. So, you know, uh, biophilia is becoming very important and um, trending right now in interior design. And when I say biophilia, um, that is the love of nature and all things natural. And um, we are using that more and more today, which makes me happy. So we'll talk a little bit about some other plants that you can um, use as house plants. Of course, you've got your flowering house plants like your African violets and orchids and um, plants that flower inside create elegance and form, fragrance and a little bit of pop of color, which is just refreshing. You can use hanging baskets in your home um, to create screens at windows if you want some privacy um, and uh, also some linear elements like the palm that you see to the right or other standing floor pants. And house plants can even live in glass, not in grass, they do live in grass, um, but in glass. And here you see some terrariums that make um, the care of house plants even, even easier. These it, these um, terrariums create their own little microclimate inside. And um, because it is all encased, it allows the plants to evaporate their water, um, which forms condensation inside, which then runs down and moistens the soil. And, um, and as debris falls from the plants and whatnot, that breaks down just like compost and becomes, um, adds nutrients and, and whatnot to the plant. So um, these you can't put in direct sunlight because it would be too hot. Think about a greenhouse. Um, but I enjoy a terrarium right near my front door, close to the side light. I also have one at a kitchen table that sits in front of a window. And um, I've had a terrarium that I, was given to me to restore and when it was given to me, I watered it. I didn't water it for six months. And then I only watered it twice in a year. Um, that's about all a terrarium needs if it's, if it's got the cycle going of the condensation and the breaking down of, of disease, of debris. 
these attractive ward cases were actually invented for the purpose of uh, plant hunters bringing back um, what they have discovered in, um, in the regions when they were out looking for plants and bringing them back to the continents and whatnot back in the 18, 1700s. So they were used for transporting, but now we use them decoratively to give plants a little boost of, of um, humidity. And also we design them so that they're decorative too. Um, here's other uh, house plants called bonsai. And um, bonsai is not an easy to care for plant, but they certainly are for someone that does maintain bonsai, very rewarding. Um, they are um, actually miniatures and they're maintained horticulturally to stay miniatures um, of examples of large plants like this maple. I think it's a maple. No, it's not a maple. Um, Sorry about that, but the one on the left, that is a tree that could grow to 150, 200 feet in, if it were in the ground and in, in our world. But by a um, horticulturalist carefully trimming the roots and, and um, stunting the branches and whatnot, they create this exact miniature and it can live for years and years and years. So um, if you're looking for something to be creative and, um, and have a purpose, this might be for you. And then you have your edible house plants. Um, so to have a window fill full of, be uh, um, excuse me, <laughs> of greens and, and soybeans and whatnot and, and access to wonderful herbs like rosemary and oregano and basil. Um, they all grow nicely in the house and, and um, I, I don't know about you, but I don't think there's any comparison between dried um, herbs and fresh ones. So to have them available is just great. So I promised you I'd talk about the care and feeding of, and here we go. So um, I pointed out some of the growth requirements as we got started, but their requirements really aren't a lot. If you can meet these simple basic needs, you'll have a happy house plan. One is they need light. Another is they need temperature um, modification. They need water so that they can continue to grow. And then they need nutrients. That is all that is needed um, to have a house plant that is happy. Um, light is needed in order to produce food and survive. And your, um, the light at your source, say your window, is greatly affected by other things, such as the trees outdoors that, you know, when they're leafed out, they may not offer as much sunlight as during the winter months. Um, roof overhangs can cut down things, um, window curtains that might be filtering the sun, and of course the length of day and time of day and time of year, all of that, because that sun is always, you know, rising and changing and it's up higher and it's down lower, so that intensity is with us um, and we have to modify that sometimes. <clears throat> As far as what is the best location um, for houseplants in your home, we would say East is the best because it has the best of everything. Um, light, as you know, um, is cooler than that from the South or the West and it causes less water loss from plants. Um, Southern and Western exposures are sort of equal partners, if you will, and um, will give you the same results. But, um, if you think again that your sun rises in the east, settles in the west, and is always in the southern sky, um, you'll see that east and westerns get that boost from southern, but not from a northern exposure. Um, in the winter, when the sun is much higher um, and the sunlight is diminished because of day length and whatnot, if you have a southern exposure, it is really going to be ideal for you. So how do you know that your plant is getting enough light? Well, you can look at your plant and determine the, um, its growth pattern. In other words, is the space between the leaves, the stem between the leaves, is it much longer than the inner nodes on the older part of the plant? If it is, then chances are it's stretching out for more sun uh, because if it were receiving sun, it would grow at a more compact rate. Also, if you notice that your new leaves are much smaller than your older leaves, not just that they're new growth, 
but that there are newer leaves that have you know opened up to full size that can be a clue that it's not getting enough light and if your leaves are lighter green um, than the older foliage that too is a sign older leaves may die without a lot of sunlight so again just take a look at it if if you um your stems are longer in between your leaves then your um the lower part of the plant it's a good sign that you need to provide more sunlight your temperatures for the plants, um, they do like a little diversity in, in um, temperature. So by day, they like a, a temperature of 70 to 80 degrees. Unlike us humans, we don't always want 80 degrees on us. Um, and then by night, they like a cooler time to sort of rest and, and regroup and whatnot. So um, if you have a thermostat that you are able to adjust and maybe you already do lower your thermostat at night, your plants will be very happy that you've done that for them. So um, keep in mind by day, 70 to 80, and by night, if you can lower it a few degrees, um, you'll get some nice results from that. Um, humidity is just the amount of moisture that's contained in the air, and plants do like moisture. Um, in fact, they provide their own moisture because um, plants actually survive by um, expiring their moisture through their leaves or it evaporates through their leaves. So um, I'm not going to get into percentages or anything, but we, we all know that our bathrooms are more humid than, say, your living room where you've got a wood-burning fireplace growing or, or going all day. Um, but you do, there are ways to improve humidity around your plants. Um, some of them, one thing you can do is place your plants closer together. This is something that I do religiously. I keep them all together. It's not only makes more sense, I don't forget a plant if I keep them all in the same area. Um, and um, also because as I said, their leaves, uh, the water evaporates through their leaves, they are providing moisture and humidity for each other. Isn't that like a sisterly thing to do? I think that's so great. Another thing you can do is you can place a shallow water container with gravel under or near the plants, but be sure you don't use, um, don't let the uh, holes of your container sit in water because it would continue to wick up through the holes and keep your soil too moist. You want it to be above the water, um, but that water again will evaporate and provide additional humidity for you. You can use a humidifier. I would just caution you that you um, watch your humidifier because we had a frightening experience where we walked into a room and the humidifier was on fire um, right after I had added some water. Fortunately, it was in a room with a tile floor and nearby our fire extinguisher, so we had no problem. But just be careful of how you care for your humidifier and, um, and use it accordingly. And then, of course, you can spray water around the plants if you wanted to spritz them. It's not ideal um, if you think about how fast, if you come out of the shower and your child dry, you know, it, it, you're, you're dry pretty quickly. And if you spritz or, yourself, you know, that will, that will dry quickly as well. So um, it's there if you want to use it or if you're a nurturer and you really love caring for your plants, you can't hurt it by spraying them. So that might be something you enjoy, like giving a baby a bottle. So, so when and how to water your plants. Um, think about the type of plant you're watering. Remember we talked the difference between succulents that hold water in their, um, their body parts and others where the water just runs out and just gives the quick hydration to the roots. Um, think about the plant size, especially the root ball size, that which is submerged in soil. Um, a, the best thing to do is to have a plant that takes up the majority of the soil in a pot <clears throat> because if you have more soil than you have roots, you then are going to end up giving more water to those roots because it just has too much for what is needed. Um, and you also, before you water, you want to think about the moisture that's already there. Um, and so you really can't escape it. The best way to know that is to put your finger in the dirt and um, depress down a little bit. And if you, um, if it, 
is shows any moisture, you probably will want to um, not water at that moment. But if it is dry, you will want to water. And um, I always try to think about the size of the pot. So if I'm working in a, a say one of my uh, Boston ferns that's in a very large 15 inch container, I probably am going to use a half gallon of water to water that soil base. And I'm gonna let a little, little run out. But if I had this little um, lady here, the succulent um, that I showed you earlier, um, I probably wouldn't, I would probably only water her perhaps with maybe a cup of water if even that much. So think about the plant size and a plant type, whether it needs a lot of water and um, whether it's you know mature enough that it needs more water. And then think about your indoor environment because your environment may be very, very dry and you might need to water more often. And I would have to say that the number one reason for houseplants dying is overwatering or improper watering. And um, so that's why I say you've got to push your finger in an inch or so and um, see if it is still moist. Um, I had something at a point that I was seeing that I wanted to bring up and now it's escaping me. But anyway, um, watering meters are available if you're unsure and maybe you really, really can't put your finger in the pot, you can buy water meters at your uh, nursery and your local hardware store. Um, when you do water, you do not want to let any water sit in the saucer for the same reason I explained about the pebbles in a shallow dish um, for humidity. You do not want the water to wick up uh, into the soil again. And um, over time, you may find um, nutrients build up and salts build up in your soil. If you see white crystals um, there, you might, it may have been because of fertilizing um, that is left behind crystals. And then we need to do what we call dot leaching. Then I explained with just dumping, uh, setting it into a lot of water and letting the bubbles and the salt um, work its way out. I also think, um, I know I'm on feed your plants, but I also think it, you require, we require a good um, amount of discipline, maybe setting a, um, a schedule for yourself in your watering. We tend to, in our house, do it about once a week. Um, when the sun is really glowing, I, I will check on my plants more often, but plants do go dormant in the winter months for the most part. And so therefore they're not requiring as much moisture as they would in an active growing time. So um, again, just take a schedule. Um, don't think about watering a plant every time you see it. Say, okay, Saturday's my day to water. And um, then you go and you water as many that need water as possible and, and follow that little, little bit of discipline and the regularity and your plants will be happy. So getting into fertilizing, again, it become, it's a matter of the type of plant the um, the volume of soil that you're fertilizing and the light intensity. Um, most plants enjoy less is more. We don't need to add a lot of fertilizer to our plants, but they do need some. And without it, um, you're just going to um, not get a robust growth patterns and, and flowering and whatnot. So using small amounts um, during the winter, um, I don't even fertilize. So as I just said, they, their need for fertilizing is reduced because they're dormant. Um, I generally take a break from like November to February and not fertilize them. But during the remaining months, I, you can either fertilize a very tiny amount whenever you water your plants if that is a good way to remember fertilizing, or you can fertilize, you know, at a different time schedule. I tend to do it monthly, um, and um, and they they do well with that. And I can't wait. I didn't do I didn't fertilize in uh, February, but it's March, and I can fertilize my plants now, which means I'm going to start seeing more greenery and rear growth. So I'm excited. Um, during the summer, when the light levels increase. 
um, you're going to need more fertilizer there. And I just went over how often you should fertilize. Again, it's up to you, just a little tiny amount once a day. Always read the, um, the labels of the fertilizer that you're using, but a good 20-20-20 uh, mix um, is often all you need for houseplants and fertilizing them. Soil is very important for your houseplants. It's not what you dig up from your topsoil outside. Um, it, it is best, actually it's not even real dirt, it's a mixture of things, but any well-drained and irritated soil mix is good for your plants. You like your soil to be fluffy um, in your pots and you can make your soil mix um, yourself, or you can buy um, professional mixes that are available in um, you know any nursery and um, gardening store. But um, you're, you, we want our soils to be able to retain moisture and nutrients to um, feed our plants. And anything mixed up professionally usually does that and, um, and helps us with that. Now, um, you, can all, you can make your own soil and that can be uh, combined with coarse sand, processed bark, sphagnum moss, perlite, vermiculite, leaf mode, and others. Um, I tend to like a pro mix and then I add sand um, if, I'm, if I'm potting cacti and um, succulents because they like a more sandy, porous um, soil mix than say um, a tropical plant that might want more peat moss because that holds more of the moisture um, in the soil and, and therefore hydrates the roots. Now perlite, vermiculite, um, those are there to keep your plant fluffy and, um, and add some texture and whatnot so that the soils do not um, compact down such as heavy mucky soils that might have too much clay in it um, or just too much topsoil. If you're going out and considering buying a plant, um, it's important to know a few little things in um, understanding plants and which ones to select to bring home. And you want to only take healthy looking plants home. Um, and that usually is those that have medium to dark green leaves. But of course, if you have um, colored leaves like a cast iron plant or something like that, that's, um, that's a mute. But I always pick up the plant and under and examine the underside of foliage for plants because, uh, for pests, excuse me, because that's where you may find sucking in, insects like spider mites and whatnot. Um, so I look there, I'm looking for little spider mugs, I'm looking for little flips of white like a fly or something like that. Um, if I don't see any, then that's a good candidate to bring home. It's, uh, you don't want to invite pests into your house if you can avoid it. So look for some clues of some sucking and biting pests, like the, the sucking is pretty much checking the leaves, the biting, you can see um, pieces of the leaves missing and whatnot. And disease tends to um, spot your leaves and, and you see um, cases of um, yellowing of the leaves and brown spots and whatnot. So try to avoid those particular plants. Light brown or dark brown spots, as well as long brown rows that you find on fern leaves are one difference here. They are spores and they are not a sign of disease. So um, seeing those little lies on the back of a fern is a good sign that it's healthy. So um, don't, don't worry about them when it comes to ferns. Okay. You got your plants, you brought healthy plants. Um, now you wanna keep them healthy. And to do that, you just need to provide those growth requirements that um, we just reviewed and inspect it regularly. Watering your plants is a great time for really looking closely. Um, I don't grow plants just to look at them. I grow plants just 
just because I like seeing them grow and, and what interesting things they throw off. So that watering is really the time that I appreciate my plants most because I'm inspecting them for new growth, new flowers. Um, it's also a time I might see that some fungus or insects are creeping in and I can take care of it before it gets out of hand. Um, and also you want to keep your leaves clean and remove any dust and swifters can do that quite easily. Um, even a little blow dryer on, on low heat can keep your, your leaves clean. And then as your plants grow, um, if it gets root bound and it's a plant that doesn't to be root bound, then it might be time to repot them. So you only repot them when their root system is very large and crowded. Um, they do not need just for the sake of, I want it bigger, it's time to grow, and so I'll put it in a bigger pot. Yeah, that that um, would not make for a hoppy plant. Um, and it would kind of look funny to have a small pot in, or small plant in a big pot. Oops, how did I go backwards, sorry. Okay, some nuisances um, that we have to deal with with our plants. On the left, I have a little chart of some of the pests in our um, that are likely to invade if if a uh, if a plant is distressed, like white fly. Now, white fly, if you have it, you actually um, if you approached a plant and maybe watered it, and you saw suddenly looks like white little flittering things around. That is probably white fly. Um, and then there's black fly or aphids. Aphids is one, if you look at your new growth and you've got all these little teeny, 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 tiny little bugs there, um, and they're chameleons. They can be brown, they can be green, um, but then you would mean that you've had an attack of aphids. And um, there's other things like your patches on leaves that can be due to funguses and disease, powdery mildew. Um, mealybugs tend to uh, mealybugs tend to affect the um, the the inner nodes. Um, they have that little white covering that has to be broken down to remove them. And you have rust and leaf ball. Um, all different pests. And some can be treated with insecticidal soap and um, some we need fungicide to do that. And I, I always try to use the most natural approach to um, take care of these pests before I get into anything really serious. Um, if you do go for um, an insecticide or pesticide, please be sure to read the labels and don't over apply anything. Um, you don't wanna hurt your plants trying to ignore them. Sometimes we just have to accept that we have to discard the plant, that it's not worth um, the insects they have and the, the prospect that they could spread to our other plants and keeping it around. I'm having a great battle with a 50 year old bat, uh, ficus plant that we bought on our honeymoon. And um, it's got scale, a major amount of scale, and uh, but I'm battling it. <laughs> it is, I'm checking for scales every other day and I'm spraying it with neem oil. Um, down on the bottom, you'll see an enlarged picture of what a mealybug looks like. And on the right, since spider mites tend to be very, very, very small, um, the spider webs are tend to be a giveaway that you've got um, those pests there. But then you got this other fellow in the upper right corner there, that pest. Um, we have our pets that tend to like our plants as well. So what can we do for that? Um, first off, if you've got a sick plant, you want to isolate it from your other house plants. Um, if you can take it to your sink and spray the leaves and stems with water to remove as many insects as possible, that's preferable, um, especially some of those that can move around like white fly and aphids. Um, and then insecticidal soap uh, is again the, the natural way to, to do that and spray those undersides and all other parts of the plants well. Um, neem oil is another natural one that um, is safe to use. And um, you want to repeat that process every two to four days to eliminate any hatching eggs. So if um, eggs were missed in the spring, then you're going to catch them until you um, minimize the population. Now, when it comes to those 
pesky pets that are insistent that they are at home in your pot, um, there are ways to deter them. Um, most people that have cats know all about the spray bottle technique and um, can, you know, just spritz them as a surprise. And that might might tell them that that's not a place to go because they don't like to be spritzed. You can try the startle tactic, like a you know a loud clap when you see them there, and and they might run at that point. Um, but you also can add uh, a pretty heavy layer of stones, small pebbles there, because cats don't want to dig that much to get into the soil. So um, the, that, that cover mulching it with some stones or even wine corks or something like that um, might prevent them from scratching into your soil and doing harm. And then if you must, you can sprinkle a little cayenne pepper, but don't sprinkle it heavily because you don't want it to get into their eyes or in their nose or anything, but just a little bit. Um, and that may prevent them from um, wanting to be near your plants. So when do we repot? We repot when our roots say, I need more room to expand. And here you can see a plant that is very, very root bound. Um, the roots have started encircling down at the bottom. And this one is definitely one that is ready to be repotted. When you do, you only want to go up one pot size. Um, some people tend to think I'll save myself time if I, you know, put it in the pot I want it to ultimately be in. And it's that's not good for the plant. Um, and I, I talked about that a little bit prior. So go up one plant size. If you've got a four inch pot, go up to a six inch pot. If you've got a six inch pot, go up to an eight inch pot. Um, some plants like to be divided. And um, if so, lucky you, because then you'll get some, some extra plants that you can either increase your, um, your indoor garden size, or you can give away to friends and family. And um, so dividing is simply a matter of, of taking a knife and going through and cutting it in half or gently pulling the roots apart for, um, to separate all of its parts into individual plants. Any old roots that are shriveled and brown can be cut off. They're not doing anything but taking up space. So feel free to cut them away, but don't cut away the fleshy roots that you have. You'll want to, to protect those. And your, your, um, your healthy roots tend to be whitish and, um, and not shriveled. They're usually very firm. So when you're repotting, you want to pull your plant out of the pot, shake off your excess foil, soil, um, and then you pot them in clean pots using clean utensils and um, sterile soil. And that will help you avoid some of the um, diseases and pests that we tend to have to deal with when we're gardening inside. Always make sure your container provides adequate drainage. You need to have um, a way for the water to um, move out out of the soil when it's when it's had enough. So um, try not to plant anything in a pot without, unless it's a succulent. A succulent you may if you give it just a little water, but I just as a rule always try to provide drainage. And after you do repot, your plant might be in shock for a while. Imagine you just took it up, shook it out, cut it up, um, you know, you did all sorts of things and you put it in this brand new fresh soil that they're like, whoa, wait a minute, I'm getting a big, big meal here. Um, so just expect that it might look a little sad for a week or so, but nurture it, care for it, and um, it will reward you with um, really um, large amount of growth after you repot it. If you have the ability to do it, um, moving your plants outside in the summer is, um, is wonderful and the things that it does for plants. Um, you, there you've got all of nature taking care of it. And, um, you know, I think about reciprocity. I've been reading the, um, um, what is it? The breeding sweetgrass. 
braiding sweetgrass and they talk about you know the earth giving to plants and the plants giving to earth and all of that so um when they're outside we have rain when it rains and humidity when it's it's all natural and as long as we protect them from wind and sun they are going to benefit by um, brighter colors in their leaves by um, faster growth um, more frequent um, flowering and whatnot um, but you might need to water more because they are gra actively growing but that's easily accomplished because we have hoses and whatnot outside so um, if it's not raining provide for if we're having steady rain and whatnot I take care of them just like the lawns and the gardens if they need water they get it if they don't I leave it be and you might want to increase your feedings during the time of vigorous growth. That's when the nutrients are most important. And as always, inspect your insects and treat accordingly before you move back inside. I tend to take our plants out um, late May, about the time of, of um, the last frost, and bring them in um, in early fall. Sometimes it's mid-October before they go in. I tend to watch the weather. And if the temperature, nighttime temperatures drop below 45, um, they've got to come in. So, um, but I also look very carefully and um, check for insects. They, go, they all get some um, cleaning and washing off, repotted and whatnot before they move back inside. So let's create some living gardens inside, things that you can do to stage your plants to um, not only give you that air purifying-ness um, and all the other benefits they give you, but the pleasure of enjoying them for um, their edibleness or um, just how they improve your overall surroundings. On the left, you see some, an herb garden as a vertical garden. It's hanging on the wall. Notice it's got its light, light source right next to it with the adjacent window. And um, how lovely are these little pots of herbs in a little spinning tray there? Um, I just think it's just very, very cute and clever. Dish gardens where you combine more than one plant together. Um, is another way to set off your plants. These um, particular plants all are low light plants. I actually made this container for an outdoor container and loved it so much I brought it inside. But um, again, they have the same growth requirements and same needs, low light and the same water requirements as well. But how pretty they all work together. Succulents. Um, you can see my ladies on the left there and uh, over here. These are um, wonderful ways to display them in decorative pots. Um, with succulents, I like to make dish gardens and, and work with all the textures and whatnot. Um, and I, it, textures and colors and, and just little pups that they put off. It's just, just wonderful. So think about them. Again, um, succulents can be very, very low maintenance as long as you give them a, a good source of light. And you can have hanging gardens. Um, you can have uh, the, the spider mite, or spider mites, the spider plant, and there's lots of other um, strawberry plants and whatnot that um, grow better if they are in a hanging container and allow their, their greenery and stems to drape over the pot. Um, in this picture, you're seeing my air plant garden. Um, which is right above my kitchen sink. And yes, that is Spanish moss that I have been growing there for four years now. Um, these plants, you'll see they're not sitting in any water or anything. There's no soil. I merely take them out um, every week or sometimes two weeks, throw them in the sink for 10 minutes, soak, shake them out, and then put them back in place when they're dry. And that's all they need. And then once in a while when they're sitting in their water, um, especially when um, they're going to be growing a little more actively, I will do some fertilizing, but just a little bit. You can brighten a dark corner and add vertical interest with your plants. And I showed you earlier how you can do that by adding additional um, light source for your plants. But start, select a plant that already is one that um, doesn't require a lot of light. 
we talked about the benefits of grouping our plants together uh, for supporting each other's systems and humidity and whatnot. But here they also just look great because one enhances the other. So group them together. I was um, complimenting um, uh, <laughs> Marcy a little bit earlier when she was on. She's off now about her house plants that are sitting near her um, office desk and uh, just made for a nice environment for her to work in. If you're um, grouping plants together, um, you'll want to vary the height for visual interest because we like things tall, medium, and low, you know, so our eye can move around, but also so that they um, also can enjoy the, the light source and not be um, the, the shaded out from taller plants. Apothecary jars and, and whatnot are great to um, plant up with moisture loving plants like this lady slipper um, orchid that you see here with um, some ferns and whatnot. So um, again, decoratively, I think that they're just very, very beautiful and clever and you can get so many different combinations when you put them together. And you can just show up your roots. Some plants will, you know, especially water loving ones, um, love to show off their roots. And I think all parts of a plant are equal in my outdoor gardening. I don't only talk about the, um, the flowers, I talk about the greenery and, and the contrast of texture and whatnot. So um, a, a nice container, clear container, and allow it to grow in there. Again, fertilize it just occasionally and that plant will be very happy. And think about it, you won't have to water it. Look at how nicely this um, vertical garden has become a focal point of this room. And again, they're all very low light growing plants that are there, ferns and orchids. And I'm assuming that it's a bright room because it is you know, a, away from a source of window, but I have to assume that they're either artificial plants or if they've got a good source of light. But if you've got a good source of light, this is just, I just think it's striking combining a decorative container with your, with your plants. And wow, talk about um, removing odors and um, cleaning your air. This beautiful wall system um, for us <laughs> biophiles, um, would make me extremely happy. I don't know if any of you have been over to the Berkshire Botanical Garden, but in their educational center, they have two vertical garden walls. And um, it's interesting to go back because they're always changing out the plantings and whatnot, but it's just wow when you see one. I grow plants for many reasons, to please my soul, to challenge the elements, or to challenge my patients for novelty or for nostalgia, but mostly for the joy of seeing them grow. And I hope that you do too. And I hope that you have a little bit more information to be a very successful indoor gardener. And I just wanna thank you for um, your hour of time and sharing your lunch with me. And if there's any questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can get to them. That was great, Denise. I was sitting here thinking this should be a master class on how to give a talk because you do such oh. a good job <laughs> at presenting. I mean, it was all lovely and the good visuals and well organized and just a joy. So thank you. I we do have some questions in the chat box. So let me pull that open. All right. I have the answers. My miss is always right. <laughs> Let's see. Um, please address how to maintain bird of paradise leaves oil like do you do you put oil or wax or shiny they used to have that stuff in the spray can that you could spray and dust your leaves with oh um i happen to have a very large bird of paradise plant and i I, the only thing I do is dust it. Um, at, it goes outside in the summer months and, um, you know, of course it's cleansed from the rains and whatnot. 
Um, the only thing that I had to worry about with the bird of paradise is mealybugs. And I guess because mealybugs are not prolific, there's one or two at a, at a leaf node. Um, I'm looking at it intensely and cleaning the leaves at the same time. So I don't use any, any sprays on it. Um, and I've never used any sprays on my, um, any of my indoor gardening plants to keep them shiny, just a just a light dusting and mine look very healthy. I'm looking now for a little flower. I'm thinking I repotted it last year and had to cut through the big stiff growth and everything. And um, it survived quite nicely. So I hope that answers your question that um, you just need to dust it. And if it does get dirty, sometimes I'll take when I'm treating it for the uh, mealybugs and just swipe it with a little alcohol, but not a lot. Do you ever round up your plants in the winter and put them in the shower just to wash them off? Yeah, yeah, because that, yes, that, yeah, that reminded me when you were, you were talking about leaching out the tobacco, but that then that mm -hmm. kind of an idea. Right, yes, no, that's great. In fact, um, I remember when we, uh, when, when we're gone for a long period of time, I will move as many plants as I can into a bathtub to group them together. And um, if somebody's coming in to water my plants, it makes it easier for them to do that too. Um, but yes, a shower, I do that, especially with the Boston ferns. I actually take them into the bathtub and let them soak in a good amount of water for a while because they, the roots of a, a Boston fern are very, very um, numerous and, and they take up a lot of volume in the soil. So when you water, um, the, the water tends to run through very, very quickly and doesn't evenly water them. So giving them an occasional good soak um, is very healthy for them. How about timed release fertilizer? Oh, like Osmoco. Hmm. Oh, sure. Um, you can use time release. And uh, again, just follow your package instructions. You can mix your um, time release in with your soil when you're repotting or add a little bit to the top, um, but just carefully pay attention to the instructions of that particular fertilizer. And this is kind of a similar question. What, what, are, what are some brands of fertilizer you use? The kind dissolved in water or do you use dry and spread on the surface or in the soil, like slow release fertilizer? Uh, I'll I don't like to recommend a specific fertilizer, but I will say that I have been, um, I, I use pretty much miracle Grow for everything um, indoors. Now, when it comes to outdoors, that's a different subject. You know, we put compost down on the soil and we do use, enrich it with, um, with other top dressings. But inside, um, a liquid fertilizer or um, a dry fertilizer that is moistened or even, again, your time release. Um, any of them are, are great. Again, less is better, but some is needed. Uh, does perlite or vermiculite in bags expire? David, do you have an answer? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. I, I read that when it came in and I thought, I, I've never seen any evidence of that go bad, like go bad in any way, really. Yeah. I mean, those are sort of um, products that are mined and then expanded with heat. So they're natural sort of minerals and they don't really attract moisture necessarily when they're in a bag. I don't think they rot. So I wouldn't say they really do go bad necessarily. Yeah. And again, there's that fluffiness to the soil that they add. Yeah. I mean, and, they're really important soil additives. Yeah. Uh, are there any benefits to air plants for cleaning the air? I don't know that answer. I'll have to do some research, but that's a good question. And I'd be happy to, to, um, to look that up. I guess I'd like to know as well. Mm. So thank you for that question. Uh, here's one that is right up Denise's alley, I know. How do I get my orchid to rebloom? Um, well, an orchid to, in order an orchid to rebloom, um, 
you need to be patient because most orchids only bloom once a year. But when they do bloom, that bloom lasts forever if you care for it um, very well. This particular orchid that's in bloom now, um, see here. I think it's just so great. I love it. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this just came into bloom in, oh, uh, December. I think it came into bloom in December. And uh, here it is, March, and it is still going. Uh, so you have to be patient as long as your watering and your fertilizing uh, schedule are going well and you're doing it regularly, you will be rewarded. Phalaenopsis too, which is this type of orchid, is the easiest one to get to bloom inside. Um, most everybody has success with them and they will rebloom on the same stem sometimes. And this one has done that. Um, so anyway, the secret is to be patient, only expect it will throw off stems once a year. And um, you just have to be consistent in your care of that plant when it is not in flower and when it is in flower. When it's in flower, do not let it dry out at all. Even one time, if your blooms do get too dehydrated, those flowers are going to fall off and you'll have to wait for another um, flowering session for them to come back. Mm. Now, like that'll finish flowering. And then will you put that plant outside in the spring and let it spend the summer outside in a kind of a protected place? I do. All of those orchids go outside. In fact, the ones that do not go outside are the ones that are in flower. I don't have that many in flower at that time. Um, but if so, I don't bring the flowering ones out because insects and whatnot like them and, and you know, God forbid we were to have some hail or something like that. But I bring them outside and they are in um, shaded areas. Um, they're in an underside of a deck and also you can suspend them from tree limbs and whatnot with S hooks. And uh, again, you don't have to do much care of orchids if you bring them outside and they will love that consistent rain and whatnot that we have and the ability to just drain right through and us not having to worry about water or removing trays and saucers and whatnot. And then do you fertilize those during the summer? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. Once a month is my schedule. But again, if someone is a once a week person, um, I think, David, you're, you're a once, you do small amounts all the time, right? As opposed to um, once a month. Yeah. For my outdoor plants, I have a, what's called a hose on. And it runs uh -huh. a tiny amount of fertilizer in the water all the time. Oh, so, okay. yeah, yeah. So it, it waters water. consistently, but it, it can be done either way. Yeah, yeah. But yes, they're definitely, um, you know, orchids need that consistent care twelve months of the year. Uh, good. Does the time of year matter when repotting plants? Hmm. Well, I don't want to be wrong on this. <laughs> and I'm not sure that there's any, any theory to it, but I tend to do my repotting um, mostly in the summer months, just because I can do it, you know, in an area where it's not as messy. But if something needs repotting beforehand, um, I do it in, in when it needs repotting. But mostly, um, I like to like have that chore of today's the day I'm going to repot my plants and bring gather up all of those and and do it so um for me summer months work best but I don't think it matters you know growth wise whether you do it dormant or not the most important thing is don't put it into too big of a container don't you know go up in size so much um that will hurt your plant yeah I think that sounds good um Wow, this is a question. I have some bulbs in my refrigerator that I didn't plant out in the fall. What do I need to do to force them for Easter? Well, <laughs> you, if you've had them in the refrigerator, then they've gotten the cold treatment that they wanted. But at this point, um, you can try. I'm not sure how many weeks without looking that up, and I don't know which bulb you have, but... Um, you can take them out of 
the refrigerator and put them in some soil and um, or if there's some like hyacinths and um, well hyacinths pretty much paper whites are done um, they can be forced in water but most would like to be potted into a potting soil mixture and yes you can do that now plant them up and um, move them to a light source and start watering and give them some fertilizer and hopefully they will bloom in time but again you're going to have to check the bulb types and um, know how long it takes to force them. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Janice wrote about bringing in a tree frog on a house plant when she was moving it inside and she didn't really realize that and the tree frog started screeching <laughs> when the wood stove was turned on. So yeah, but check your plants when you bring them in. That's a good tale, right? Yeah, I have to say, I actually moved my plants first into the garage and I set off a fogger overnight. It's an easy thing to do. Um, you know, you buy these little can mixes at your garden store or hardware store. Um, they're foggers and this is supposed to kill all of the, the pests and whatnot. I don't want to bring in slugs and well, the tree frog might have been cute though. Yeah. <laughs> um, I probably would have kept him as a pet. <laughs> but yes, you want to inspect your plants well. You want to clean them well. Take your hose spray and spray them down. Um, and, and I also try to avoid putting my house plants directly on the ground. Like I don't put them on patio um, blocks or anything because slugs could enter into the pot. So I always keep them elevated when they're outside. Our indoor herbs have not thrived this year as they have in the past. We have grow lights. How far away should they be? And do indoor herbs go dormant? Wow, that's a good question. Well, I may have to defer to you, David, because I don't use grow lights for herbs and I haven't done much research on using grow light for herbs, but um, I, I'm hoping that they're getting the same hours of light and that your grow lights are the same intensity as your previous years um, because grow lights do weaken um, in their intensity as they age. And um, I'm guessing your grow lights are, are replacing a window sill or something like that. So that would be my first thought, check to make sure that you um, maybe replace your bulbs and uh, maybe increase the number of hours. Plants generally like at least six hours of, of sunlight. Um, yeah, no and with grow what. lights, you have to run them a lot. I mean, a grow light probably has to be on for 12 hours a day, at least, I think. Right. And it really has to be pretty close to the plants um, because that outdoor natural light is so much more intense than an artificial light. So the light has to be pretty close to the plant. I would run it. 12, even 14 hours a day. And then I don't know, you know, some herbs probably are, well, definitely some herb plants are much longer lived, like a, a rosemary plant would live for decades. But a basil plant, I think it would be hard to keep that going a long time. You know, basil to me is sort of an annual crop. I don't think that's going to really be a plant you could keep long term. And all, all, all plants kind of naturally, unless they're getting enough light in the winter in this part of the world, just go into the slow growth. So it could just be physiological too. Mm -hmm. uh, do some plants clean the air better than others? I think they all offer benefits as long as they're taking in the moisture and, and the air and bringing it through its, its chlorophyll and all of that, that process. Um, I think all of them will be beneficial for you. But the ones that I pointed out were the ones that were in the spacecraft when they, when they went up into space. <laughs> How useful are plastic pots? Liners for decorative clay or ceramic that might leach out water from soil? I mean, I guess it means do they make good liners. Do any plants do better in plastic? 
Well, I will say that I use liners almost 100% of the time. I like to put my plants in a, in a plastic pot and set that pot into a decorative container. Um, my little lady here, again, you will see is in a decorative pot. Um, I do that for my containers outside because um, as I mentioned with the, um, the wicking of water from a clay pot or just taking you know, the moisture away from it, having that barrier there just retains the moisture a little bit more. It's also easier to service if you wanted to bring it to a sink location to water it, you know, the drainage would be there. So it allows me to use decorative containers, but provide um, the necessary um, care that the house plants require. Again, I use it for everything. It holds the moisture longer and um, it's just a cleaner process. Uh, do you leave the saucers under your plants outside in the summer to prevent things like earthworms from getting into the pots? Again, I don't put my pots down on the ground. I don't recommend that. Um, they can pretty much crawl up a pot, saucer pot. And, um, but if you do have saucers outside, if you keep your plant in a saucer outside, you need to be aware of the, mo the water collecting there and you need to empty it. So um, that's kind of the time I put away all of those saucers and um, just let the, the plants drain naturally outside. Yeah, I would be Is worried. That it, David? I would be worried about impeding, you know, holding too much moisture. Yeah. You know, when that saucer fills up when it rains or something, you wouldn't right, want it to right. sit in the water. Um, yeah. you know, I guess, at least in theory, if you were going to, you know, repot a plant that was going to go outside, you could put some window screen in the bottom. That might keep some stuff out. Yeah. Again, I just kept, set them out on tabletops. I mount them on, on posts. You know, I have power pots or post, special things, rings that I can set a flower pot into. Um, and hang them from trees and whatnot. So even, you know, the big plants, they are in um, taller containers because uh, again, slugs and worms and all those little things that run underground, um, I don't want to bring inside. But, you know, you put, we're talking about this water and accumulating in saucers. I should mention too with succulents, I have a lot of succulents and um, we've talked a lot about them not needing a lot of water. I'd love for them to sit out in the full sun on the deck and everything, but if we have a rainy period, I actually need to move those plants. I'll move them quickly under, say, the table that I have out on the deck, um, or even under furniture, so that um, they're they're not getting they they have time to dry out between rains. Mm. Well, we live in a wet climate. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a night blooming serious? in your kitchen next to the air plants. Has it ever flowered for you? Oh, good call. Good catch. That is a night blooming cirrus and I'm <laughs> training it to grow up, but I'm actually going to turn my computer around and you will see this night blooming cirrus that I have in my office here. It's my pride and joy. Um, can you see it? Oh, wow. I, I'll go down a little bit. Go down. Yeah. It's right behind you, right? Right behind me. You see it sitting on a table. And that stem goes all the way up. And I have created this grid on the ceiling with <laughs> fishing wire. Wow. And it's climbing all over the ceiling. Wow. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> I love it. And it does bloom. Um, Yes, it does bloom. It do, blooms once a year for me, um, usually in the summer. Night blooming cirruses are wonderful. They are so fragrant. The flower is like 12 inches in diameter when it opens, but it opens and closes in one night. Um, so you got to catch it quickly. But uh, yeah, it's a jungle cactus. And um, so it grows in the understory and up it climbs up trees and whatnot. In my case, I'm just letting it scramble across the ceiling and they bloom. 
<laughs> That's very cool. <laughs> well, thank you, Denise. Uh, a few people wrote in and said, thank you. It was great. Thank you for all the information. 